Hi everyone, today we start a sermon series on the Imago Dei. That's Latin meaning the image of God, the notion that all of us are made in God's image. And this is important because the Imago Dei impacts our lives. It speaks to our origin, our identity, your sense of belonging and community and purpose in life. In the ancient world, kings were often given godlike status. They were frequently referred to as gods, and they often built statues or images of themselves as mighty gods. The Hebrew people, however, were different. They were told not to make idols. The Hebrew word tselem means image or idol. Throughout scripture, idolatry is forbidden. They weren't meant to build images of God, partly because you can't reduce the infinite nature of God into an image, but also because God had already created many, many images of himself when he created humanity, when he created you and me. And just as pagan kings had built godlike images of themselves to justify their right to rule, so God made us in his image to rule and reign over creation in our everyday work, shaping the world. We see this in the creation story in Genesis, with Adam and Eve given authority to steward creation for God. But as we know, they messed up. They were tempted by the devil to go against God's command, and they therefore ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which meant that they got to decide and define good and evil for themselves instead of listening to God's word on this. And as such, they made bad decisions. And humanity continues to make some bad decisions today and mess things up. Think wars or injustice, poverty, pollution, etc. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the foundational verses of the Imago Dei in the creation story. This is Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Notice how in verse 26, it refers to the fact that we're made in God's image, that word selem, and in God's likeness, the Hebrew word demut, which means to resemble God. Now, are these two terms, image and likeness, referring to the same thing? Or are they different aspects of our being? The early church fathers like Irenaeus and even later Thomas Aquinas saw them as different. They believed that image was the universal quality that all humans carry as the image of God. Whereas for them, they believed that likeness was a specific likeness reserved for those in Christ who are being transformed into the likeness of God through Jesus Christ, a process called sanctification, with the character of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, growing in them. Now, I I don't know which it is, but I certainly don't believe that Christians have a monopoly on godly characteristics, such as kindness or honesty or patience. But it should mean that we grow in these character traits as we follow Jesus Christ. In other words, being a Christian doesn't make you better than the next person, but it hopefully makes you more like Jesus than you were yesterday. So we're made in the image of God and are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. It's a bit like if you have a child. The child may look like the parent, but does it have the same character as the parent. Character forms over time. Now, sometimes people outside the church can think that Christians believe that they're superior. And some, not all, but some love to point at the failings of Christians and say, ah, see, you messed up, you hypocrites. 
But I think that church communities are a little bit like a gym. You know, when you go to the gym, you see some people there who look like they've spent a long time in the gym. They look like real athletes. But you also see people in the gym that look really out of shape. But that's fine. That's precisely why they're in the gym. They're in the right place. And then you also see some people in the gym, like me, who look quite fit, but if you watch them for anything more than two minutes on a treadmill, you realize they're really not fit at all. So regardless, each person is in the right place. They're in the gym. And it's a bit like that for everyone in church. You are in the right place. If you're watching this right now, you're in the right place. Now, whilst we consider the likeness of God that we carry, we must, however, still maintain a necessary distinction between God and humanity, between creator and creation, not muddling up the likeness of God with being God-like. We aim to be godly, not gods ourselves. If you think about Adam and Eve, they were made in the likeness of God. But when the serpent tempted them to eat the fruit that was forbidden, the temptation put before them was that they'd become godlike in their decisions. The serpent says to them in Genesis 3 verse 5, For God knows that when you eat of it, the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The Imago Dei in us is a bit like a photo. So this is an image, a, a photo of Gordon Ramsay, right? When you see that photo now, it probably reminds you of Gordon Ramsay. Uh, it might even signpost you to go and look at some of his stuff. But this image on screen is not the man himself. It's not actually Gordon Ramsay. And it's a bit like that, like us. You and I, we are an image of the creator, the Imago Dei. Hopefully people look at us and we signpost them, we point them to God. But we're not God himself. We're just an image. But likewise, you wouldn't take an image or a photo of somebody and stamp on it or walk all over it. That would show disrespect of the person. And the Imago Dei means also it impacts how we see others as well. You see, when God made Adam and Eve, we read in Genesis 1, verse 27, male and female, he created them. The theologian Karl Barth argued that the image of God, therefore, is only complete when male and female are together. But this doesn't mean in marriage that you, somehow you're only the Imago Dei if you have a partner. Think about it. Jesus never married, nor did the Apostle Paul. Rather, it means as a society as a whole, as humanity in totality. In fact, the early church shocked the world in how it treated everyone as equal. Galatians 3.28 says, Therefore, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And this then leads us on to the fundamental age-old question. Who are we? What does the Imago Dei, the fact that you're made in the image of God, say about your identity? Do you know, only once in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 11, is the word image, and the New Testament Greek word here for image is icon, only once does the word image of God, only once is it used of mankind. On all the other occasions in the New Testament, the phrase image of God is used. It is in reference to Jesus. You know, Jesus came to show us what God is like. Colossians 1.15 says of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. He is God. He's the son of God. But Jesus came also to show us what true humanity can look like. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, 
It refers to Jesus as the last Adam or the second Adam, the perfect human, the one who ushers in new, new humanity, new creation. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says this of Jesus. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus shows us how to rule and reign once again, but this time following his example through serving others, through humility, through obedience, through loving our enemies, and as we'll see, even dying for them. So if you want to know what the image of God, your identity truly looks like, then don't just look at yourself, at ourselves. It's a bit like if you go to the fun fair, sometimes it's that house of mirrors and you go in the house of mirrors and there all those funny mirrors that when you look at yourself, you see a reflection, but it's a distorted image of yourself, either this way, that way or, or whatever. And we don't get a true image. And that's what sin does in our lives. It produces a warped image of ourselves. Sin causes a distortion. So if we want to know what we should really look like, we need to look at Jesus, the one without sin, the one without distortion, the second, the last, the perfect Adam. We can't undo the distortion ourselves. This is where we need Jesus' help and his death on the cross. So what does all of this have to say about our identity? I wonder, have you ever asked that fundamental question? Who am I? Well, being a Christian isn't just about what you think, although it involves the transformation of our minds. It's not about what you feel, although it involves an experience of God. It isn't about what we do, although it alters the way we live. Being a Christian isn't even about the group we belong to, though it redirects and reshapes our relationships. Being a Christian is about something far more fundamental. It's about your identity. It redefines who you are. And we often forge our identity on things like race, politics, our relationship status, our appearance, how many followers we have, our wealth, our personality, our sexuality, our work, or even others' opinions of us. Or we can forge our identity on internal things like our desires, ambitions, or character. But all these things are fragile. I mean, what if your identity is in your work and then you lose your job? Or what if your identity is on your looks and then you age? What if your identity is on getting good grades and then suddenly you flunk that exam? Our identity can't be based on our ability. I mean, what if we have a disability? Does that mean we're any less made in the image of God? No, not at all. And all these things we often build our identity on, they're often based on comparison with others to measure how we're doing against them. But this can lead either to pride, if it's a positive comparison, or insecurity, if it's a negative comparison, and often division. You know, in um, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, I don't know whether you've read the books or you've watched the movie, The Lord of the Rings, in it, the evil Sauron pours all of his power, malice, and self into the ring. So that if the ring is destroyed, so is he. So all of these things we try to build our identity on, they're terrible things actually to base our identity on as they're all temporary. They won't last. Far better to base our identity on something that is totally secure and will never end. You see, if you're a Christian, 
or even if you're not yet a Christian, whoever you are, at the core of our identity is not our appearance, achievements, personality, or character. It is simply this. You are loved by God. God's love for you is unending, unconditional, unshakable. It's perfect. In his gospel account, the disciple John always refers to himself as, quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, this was not John being boastful. It's just that he understood his identity as a child of God, perfectly loved by God. So we should do the same. And likewise, the Apostle Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome starts in a very telling way. Like other letters in the ancient world, Paul begins with establishing who the letter's from and who the letter is to. In other words, it begins with identity. Now, if he'd started his letter with the words, Paul, to the church in Rome, greetings, it would have been perfectly adequate for how letters started back then. But instead, he writes this in Romans 1 verse 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. He's addressing the believers in Rome, the capital of the world. So he could have addressed them as world rulers, lawmakers, the center of culture and power, or even those persecuted for their faith. However, he doesn't do that. We see that although they are in Rome, they are not defined by Rome. Instead, they are defined by being loved by God. The same is true for you. The philosopher Descartes famous, famously said, I think, therefore I am. But for a Christian, it's a case of, I am loved, therefore I am. And when you know that you are loved by God, it changes everything. It changes the way you think, the way you feel, the way you behave, and it changes, most importantly, your very identity. It sets you free. It secures you forever in God's love. It makes you unshakable so that we no longer need to pretend or prove ourselves. In 1 John 4 verse 8, it tells us that God is love and you are made in the image of God, which means that you are invited into the perfect love of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You're made in the image of the Trinity, not just in the image of Jesus. The Father, Son, and Spirit have perfect love for one another in the Trinity. And that's the same love they have for you and that you're invited to participate in. You're made in their image. And this perfect, unending, unconditional love that God has for you has been demonstrated for you supremely by Jesus, God the Son, through his death on the cross for you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and that includes you and me, that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus didn't just come to show us an undistorted view of humanity. He didn't just come as a model for us. He came as a Messiah for us. Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15 says of Jesus, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that his death might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. And in verse 17, it says, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. 
you know, back to Paul's introduction to his letter to the Romans. He could have written, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, and stopped there. But we actually read this in Romans 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his promised prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his human nature, was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. In other words, Paul begins saying who the letter's from himself, but he gets distracted by the one he serves. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, a descendant of David, who was resurrected from the dead, our Lord. For Paul, it seems the identity of Jesus was far more important than his own identity, because it is in Jesus Christ that we find our true identity as one loved by God. Because who is Jesus? He is the one loved by the Father. We read in the Gospels that when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, as he came out of the water, the Spirit descends upon him. And the voice of the Father is heard from above saying, this is my Son, whom I Love, the perfect love of the three members of the Trinity shown in that baptism. And in Christ, we are adopted as children of God and the Father speaks those same words of love over you and me right now. And the love of the Father for the Son is felt through the Holy Spirit. And the love of God for you is experienced through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes later in his letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 5, God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now, the process of coming to know this love can be a little uncomfortable. There may be times, not always, but there may be times that God challenges or remove, removes the things that we've held on to as markers of our identity, things that ultimately fail us. And that process of stripping them away can be a little uncomfortable at times. I have a friend called Johnny who, he was a brilliant student, he was at university, he was a great sportsman, a Christian, but then unfortunately he got ill and he was diagnosed with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and then eventually ME. And in the end, he had to drop out of university. He couldn't do any work. He couldn't even read. He was just lying in his bed. And then eventually he got to a stage where once a day he could go for just a very short walk around the block. And one day he was walking with a friend of his He's actually um, a monk. And on that walk, they walked for two or three minutes and were then having to take a break because Johnny was so tired. They sat on some steps. And his friend said to Johnny these words. He said, Johnny, I'm glad this is happening to you. And Johnny was a bit taken aback by first. He thought, this isn't very encouraging. But then his friend continued. He said, I'm glad this is happening to you because you don't know who you are, but you're about to find out. And sure enough, as through that illness, everything was stripped away from Johnny, he then had an amazing experience of God's love for him. The Spirit poured into him. And suddenly, he knew exactly who he was. 
He's now well. He's ordained as a pastor. He's married, got four kids, doing amazing things in ministry. But the key was experiencing the Spirit and that knowledge of being loved by God dropping from here to here because that changes everything. So may I pray for you right now. Wherever you are, I'm just going to pray that prayer from Romans 5, verse 5, that God would pour his love into your heart by the Holy Spirit, whom he's giving you right now. So we pray, come, Holy Spirit. I ask that you would fall upon everyone watching this right now. That they would experience being loved by you, Lord Almighty. Thank you that that is the identity, crystal clear, of everybody watching this right now, that they are one loved by God. Jesus, just as that was supremely your identity, this is my son whom I love. Thank you for everyone watching this now. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I love. And Lord, I pray that a fresh understanding and revelation of this, of being made in the Imago Dei, would set us free, free from insecurity, free from having to prove ourselves, free from fear. As it says in Hebrews, free from even the fear of death and all that is to come. And I pray that in that new found freedom, you would help us be secure in our identity as part of the family of God in belonging and with a purpose to point as an image of God, to point others in our lives to you, Lord Almighty. And I pray this all right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.